The sperm are produced in the testes, but they have a long way to go to actually get where they function in the female reproductive tract. So let's take a look at the structures that are involved in the production of semen. We start in the seminiferous tubules, where the sperm are actually made. The sperm, along with some of the seminiferous fluid, flows through the seminiferous tubules, through a few little ducts, and finally into the epididymis. The epididymis is where we see the maturation and the storage of the sperm. Until an actual ejaculation, sperm remain in the epididymis. It takes sperm about 20 days to mature in the epididymis. And they can stay there for anywhere between 40 and 60 days. After that, the sperm break down and disintegrate and they're reabsorbed by the epididymis. This is to make sure we always have room for producing fresh sperm. If a man is going to ejaculate, we want it to be with fresh sperm capable of swimming through the uterus and getting to the uterine tube. So old sperm are broken down, so there's always room for new fresh sperm, even if a man hasn't ejaculated for quite some time. The sperm and the remaining seminiferous fluid that we find in the epididymis make up about 10% of the semen that's ejaculated during intercourse. If there is going to be an ejaculation, then the sperm and the seminiferous fluid is carried through the ductus deferens from the testis up into the body cavity. The ductus deferens has a smooth muscle and can carry out peristalsis, that wave of smooth muscle contraction, to push the sperm along. The ductus deferens carries the sperm to the ejaculatory duct. The ejaculatory duct is where the ductus deferens meets the secretions coming from the seminal vesicle. The ejaculatory duct carries the sperm along with the secretion of the seminal vesicle to the urethra. The seminal vesicle is important because it contributes most of the semen. About 65% of the semen is made up of the secretions from the seminal vesicle. The seminal vesicle secretion is rather thick. It's viscous um, and yellowish. It has a basic pH and it contains a lot of fructose. And we'll come back to the importance of those components in a little bit. The ejaculatory duct carrying the sperm and the seminal vesicle fluid actually travels through the prostate gland. And as it's going through the prostate gland, the prostate gland adds more secretions into the semen. The prostate gland contributes about 30% of the semen. The secretion of the prostate gland is a thinner, more clear fluid that has a basic pH and contains an enzyme called PSA. PSA stands for prostate-specific antigen. And this PSA is actually a protein. It's an enzyme that we'll talk about in a minute. The ejaculatory duct joins up with the urethra in the prostate gland. This points to some of the importance of the prostate gland and what happens when men have an enlarged prostate. As the prostate gets enlarged, it can actually put pressure on the urethra and on the ejaculatory duct. So this can interfere with both sexual function and urinary function. When the urethra exits the prostate gland, it's joined with secretions from a little gland called the bobulourethral gland. The bobulourethral gland produces a small amount of mucus that has a basic pH. This mucus is important for providing a bit of lubrication for intercourse. Most of the lubrication for intercourse comes from the female reproductive tract, but the little bit does come from the bobulourethral gland to help with the initial penetration into the vagina. The urethra runs through the penis to deliver the sperm to the outside of the body. Let's consider those semen components for a minute. Let's start with the most important component of the semen, which is the sperm. Without the sperm, there's no point in having semen. On average, there should be between 50 and 120 million sperm per milliliter of ejaculate. This is what's referred to as the sperm cow. Another important component of the semen is its pH. Almost all the secretions we talked about have a basic pH. This is important because the vagina is very acidic. The acidity of the vagina helps protect it from pathogens, which is great for a woman, but makes it harder for the sperm. So the sperm come in the semen with a basic pH to neutralize the acidity of the vagina and increase the chances that the sperm are gonna survive. A third component of the semen that's important is a clotting enzyme that's found in the secretion from the prostate gland. 
This clotting enzyme is important because it makes the semen sticky. That helps the semen stick to the inside of the vagina. That's important so that the sperm can stay near the cervix regardless of the woman's position. So the old wives' tale that you can avoid a pregnancy by standing up right away or jumping up and down after sex is pretty ridiculous. The clotting enzyme makes the semen sticky, so it's going to stay up there regardless of what a woman tries to do to get it out. Now the downside of the stickiness of the semen is that the sperm can't swim through that. So as the semen is sticking to the inside of the vagina up by the cervix, the PSA comes into play. The PSA is a protease. It's an enzyme that cuts the sticky proteins and allows the sperm to be able to swim free so they can go up the cervix in search of the egg. The final semen component that we mentioned is fructose. The fructose is important as an energy source. Remember that the sperm are going to have to swim hard to get where they're going. They have the mitochondria they need to make ATP, but those mitochondria can't work without an energy source. The fructose in the semen provides the sperm with the energy source they need to make plenty of ATP to be able to swim to the egg. So the semen is full of great things to help the sperm, but it can't do any good unless it gets delivered into the vagina. The penis is responsible for delivering the sperm to the vagina. It's not necessary to urinate. Billions of women around the world urinate without a penis, but you need the penis for proper delivery of the sperm into the vagina. In order to do its job, the penis needs to be erect. The penis contains three columns of erectile tissue to be able to achieve an erection and deliver the sperm where it needs to be. The corpus spongiosum is found on the ventral side around the urethra. And then two columns, the corpora cavernosa, are found on the dorsal side of the penis. The corpora cavernosa are supplied with blood from the deep arteries of the penis. And the dorsal arteries carry blood to the corpus spongiosum and provide blood to the penis when it's flaccid. The erectile tissue itself is made up of blood sinuses called lacunae. These are little blood spaces. These lacunae, or these spaces, are usually kept collapsed by the contraction of smooth muscle around them. So in a flaccid penis, the lacunae are collapsed and flat, and they don't contain any blood. Erection is caused by some sort of stimulation that starts in the brain, whether it's the sight of something arousing, the thought of something sexy, um, the sound of something that you find attractive, or actual uh, physical stimulation of the genitals or other part of the body. Anything that a man finds arousing sends signals up to the brain. Those signals go down to the smooth muscle in the penis, and it causes relaxation of the smooth muscle. Relaxation of the smooth muscle holding the lacunae closed, and relaxation of the smooth muscle in the dorsal arteries and the deep arteries of the penis. When those lacunae open and the blood vessels dilate, more blood is brought into the penis, and the lacunae fill with blood. And this provides pressure that causes the penis to stiffen and get wider and longer. To give you an idea of how dramatic the change can be, here's a pair of photographs showing the same man with a flaccid penis. So this would be when all that smooth muscle is contracted, so there's no blood filling the lacunae in the erectile tissue, and an erect penis. In this case, arousal has stimulated relaxation of the smooth muscle, so the arteries have dilated to bring in more blood, the lacunae have opened, and all that erectile tissue in the penis is filled with blood, a lot of blood that creates enough pressure to cause the erection. Erection is part of the story. You have to have an erect penis to go into the vagina. And the next thing that has to happen is ejaculation, the actual release of the semen. Given appropriate stimulation, the signal comes from the brain down to the penis to cause ejaculation. Signals come from the brain down to the accessory structures of the male reproductive system in order to lead to ejaculation. Several things need to happen. Remember that the sperm just sit in the epididymis until it's time for ejaculation. So we need to get those sperm moving. The ductus deferens contracts and pushes the sperm up through the ductus deferens into the ejaculatory duct, where it's joined with the secretions from the accessory glands. 
the secretions from the seminal vesicle, the prostate gland, and the bulbourethral gland join the sperm as it goes into the urethra. Then, to push the ejaculate out of the urethra, there's a contraction of the bulbal spongiosis muscle at the root of the penis. This contracts and squeezes the root of the penis and pushes the semen out of the tip. The typical ejaculate is about 3 milliliters. Now, if you think about the fact that there's somewhere between 50 and 120 million sperm per milliliter of ejaculate, and 3 milliliters per ejaculate, almost an entire day's worth of sperm production goes out with one ejaculation. 